So this message is called Live God's Adventure for Your Marriage. Live God's Adventure. You're not called to, you know, be that, what's the word, uh, that Prince Charming who arrives on that steed and then gets his woman and then takes off and leaves her behind. She's meant to be on that pony, that steed with you. She's meant to be a part of the adventure. I know that when uh, Sandra and I had Josiah as a dependent, that uh, one of the things we had was I didn't want Sandra and Josiah to be at the airport seeing me off. I wanted them to be on the plane with me, going to the adventures that we minister and going around. Speaking about adventures, understand Josiah, just sent her. I think there's eight or ten of them. Is that right, Eric, something like that? There's a group of them are at the Red Frogs this week uh, doing that mission, I call it home missions work of reaching out to students. So hold them in your prayer so you won't see them today. But they'll be back next Sunday. So to me, Joseph and Mary are two of the real heroes in the Bible. I like that. I like the images I posted this morning of former Prime Minister Tony Abbott fighting fires in New South Wales. <laughs> I love that image. There are others who are fighting about what is, what isn't. But it's seeing the former prime minister out there fighting fires. Not that he was looking for attention, but people just want to take his photo. Out of all these fires, they say only 6% of all the entirety of the fires have some sort of climate connection, if that meaning that there was a thunderstorm, lightning, something else. The majority of it are people who deliberately fight the fire. Lord, we just pray over our nation, in particular New South Wales and Queensland, and Lord, just quench these fires, I pray. More importantly, Lord, that these persons who would light these fires that have seen such horrendous damage and even deaths would have a conscience to say that this is not allowed or, the, or others around them of influence would heed them or stop them from such a thing. Protect our land, protect our families, bring rain to this land. In the grace of God, I pray. In Luke 1, 26 to 38, is a great text of Scripture. But I want to start off just by reading a, a general text. And uh, I want to read it to you. Luke 1, 26 to 38. And it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary, verse 28. And the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Now, when God says you're favored and rejoice, it doesn't mean the road ahead is going to be easy. <laughs> he says, Rejoice and be happy. I think of what the Apostle Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. For the joy of the Lord is my salvation. But she was deeply troubled by the statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. That's what I said. So when the Lord comes to you and says, rejoice, something's going to be favorable on you, just realize it could be a bit of a rocky ride. And uh, it was true. She was a little concerned. Then the angel told her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor of God. He's another key. Don't allow fear to rob you of a call. Now listen, you'll conceive and give birth to a son and you'll na you'll, you will call his name Jesus and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Verse 34, Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not been intimate with a man? So remember that she was betrothed or engaged, and according to Jewish custom or Jewish culture, that helps, doesn't it? And according to Jewish custom or Jewish culture, is that for that year of engagement of betrothed, it had to be no less than a year, and there was to be no intimacy. Today, well, we won't go into that, okay? But the fact of the matter is it meant no intimacy in that year that Petrov, once they're engaged. Many would say today, well, we're engaged. What does it matter? No, there was no intimacy. And the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Verse 37, consider your relative, Elizabeth, even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. Now, we're familiar with this story, and especially familiar because we're coming towards our Christmas time. Mary lives in the city of Nazareth. She is a virgin. She's engaged to Joseph by Jewish custom. She cannot have any sexual relationship in the course of Joseph for the year. Once they were betrothed, engaged, there's that one year of consecration setting apart. 
Nazareth. What sort of town is Nazareth? Well, I, it depends what town you'd like to call of being a difficult town. They said, could anything good come out of Nazareth? So I can imagine it came from an area that found it difficult or challenging in life. It wasn't the most influential area. And after the year of waiting, they will marry and they will consummate their marriage and move in together as husband and wife. Everything is fine. Everything is rosy. She's a teenager. And then an angel called Gabriel comes along and he turns the life totally upside down. You know what God wants to do with your life? He wants to turn it upside down. There's one of these cooking shows some years ago. I'm digressing. And it's called an upside down pizza. I think it was in New York. Now, it's very rare I even get a pizza, let alone an upside down pizza. But I'd really like to try an upside down pizza. That's where all the dressings on the bottom and the crust is on. The... Yeah, it's got nothing to do with my message. But in the context of turning your world upside down, what you think should be on top goes on the bottom. And God wants to turn your world upside down. When you get saved, it's meant to be your world is turned upside down. It's not meant to be I got saved, now my life continues as it did. It means to me there is a change. There's something happening. There is a change. And when the angel came, change is on the way. Something's about to happen. I think the first shock for Mary is I'm talking to an angel. <laughs> If there is a second shock, it's going to be, I'm going to be pregnant. The third shock is, not by Joseph. The fourth shock is, my normal life is officially over. I mean, if I was trying to think about what effects would come upon her, these four things had to be paramount. I just experienced an angelic being. He told me I'm going to be pregnant and it's the son of God. Joseph will not impregnate me. I will not know a man. And my life will no longer be normal. Now, when I say no longer be normal, it's not that there will be stadiums wanting to hear a testimony. But rather, it will be the accusation, the innuendos. It will be the inability to believe what she says is really true. Everyone's going to believe I've been intimate with a man other than my husband. Joseph is going to have a major problem. In fact, the Bible says that he was, well, we, it doesn't say it, but we know he was hurt and dismayed because he wanted to secretly divorce him. By that word there, they're not married, but mean break off the engagement. According to the law, he could have turned her in and she would have been executed. But the issue is her life is about to change. She would live in disgrace. She would live exposed. So much of the Bible, we try to read or understand through Western perception, which is really quite wrong. I was with a, a pastor just this week, uh, an older pastor, and we we're sharing. And uh, we were having a discourse or a discussion, maybe a little disagreement on certain elements of perception in areas biblically. And ultimately, I said to him, here's your problem. You keep reading the Bible through Western eyes. And I said, I don't mean disrespect to you, but it's the arrogance that we still carry today with rural Britannia and everything else to where we think that the Bible was written for Western people. Therefore, everything in the Bible is according to our Western culture and beliefs. And I said, it's nothing short of pure arrogance. The Bible was written for Jews, to the Jew first. We've been blessed by the Jewish people in two ways. Number one is because they rejected Christ, we got them. And the second blessing is because we go back to share Christ and they receive him, that's a second blessing. There's nothing wrong of coming second. It could be the best dish that you get. So when we like to read in the Bible and how we do our little pantomimes, everything else, and we, we read the part and there was no room for her at the inn, that's our interpretation. But in the literal Greek, that word for inn doesn't just mean a lodging house, but also means the family home. 
It's just that people are taking it to that because the idea is, remember, the family has rejected them. Remember, the census was you had to return from the place of origin, which is the man. Which for Joseph is Bethlehem. In America, coming up, which is the fourth Thursday in November, Canada's already had theirs, which is October, whatever, whatever, second weekend in October, what they call Thanksgiving, where they give thanks. And the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States, in many ways, is bigger than Christmas, where people will travel that day before, two days before Thanksgiving is just crazy. You don't want to fly because it's jammed and snow in certain areas is starting to fall and it's just crazy. But they come together for this family gathering. And if you came back to your hometown, you didn't go log into a hotel. You stayed in a home. Even if it meant you slept on the couch or on the floor, it was the home. You have to remember that in this time in which Joseph was taken Mary back to his family home where his family lives. It's not like saying, go stay in a hotel. It's like, where we're family. We'll make room for you. And the literal translation, there's no room in the inn, meaning the family were uncomfortable because she was pregnant, about to deliver. He's not the father. <laughs> Get the story? And they're maybe not too happy with Joseph by not putting her away at least. And they're like saying, well, there is some obligation as family, go to the stable. Now, a stable is not how we in the West think about it as well. I've been in Bethlehem. A stable is not what you think. You know, like the farmer at the back builder. The stable, okay, is normally a cave. And when I was in Bethlehem, it's like a two-story house that have a cave and the house built on top. And the, 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 the little cave or the inn area there with a little, little gate on it would be where the livestock is. It's like a garage. And so it's like the family says, well, we're not going to take you in. It's a little bit difficult, but we can't throw you on the street because she's about to give birth. So just go down in the animal stall. Now, I know what I'm saying to you can be a little contrary to how we have Christianized in our Western views of how we think should be, but, and you can still hold to that, I really don't have any problem. I mean, the very first person to do a manger scene was Francis of Assisi. He did that, you know what I mean, to create it and it's built up from there, and which is wonderful, and I think it's great, but that's where it begun. But I want you to understand that this embarrassment or ridicule or shock or shame is more than just going to a hotel that says, oh, I'm sorry, we're booked up for the night. Try Best Western down the road. I want to read a few passage here in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18 to 19. And the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together, meaning united, consummated the marriage, that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband, being a righteous man, according to God's law, righteous, not meaning self-righteous, but righteous made right by God, which means by following God's law, and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. It was a secret divorce or attempt. It just keeps reminding me of Luke 1, Nothing is impossible with God. Perhaps you might find out that since you became a committed believer, since you found out that since you gave your life to God, things aren't working out exactly as you want. This great preacher, Spurgeon, as I mentioned to you already, he's still today called the Prince of Preachers, had no formal training, self-taught. He read six books a week. See, I think I'm pretty good doing three to four. Six books a week. Incredible man of God. He suffered two debilitating diseases, as I mentioned to you already. One is gout, which is a severe foot situation. He couldn't walk. Any pressure on his feet would just give excruciating pain. Then he had a disease called Bentley's disease, which is the enlargement of the kidneys, which killed him in the end when he was 57. On top of that, he suffered massive depression because of 
those who are not believers or even those who are in believers, the many who said he was a hard preacher, he was too intense, he was too severe, uh, not enough grace, too strong in his view, too strong on moralities. He should live today. See, just because God's moving in your life, we seem to think that everything should be easy or everything should fall into place. But that's why he says in Luke 1, 37, with God, nothing is impossible. And you have to understand that if you're in business and you made a commitment to honor God in business, it doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. But with God, nothing's impossible. If you've come to the Lord and you wanna serve Him and it seems like life is challenging, there's depression or there's heaviness or there's family breakdowns. Remember the Bible says, nothing is impossible with God. All things are possible. And the Lord, the angel of the Lord, Gabriel said, you are going to carry this child and he already foresaw there was going to be horrendous problems, especially the culture and the people of the day. But remember that nothing is impossible with God. You need to remind yourself right now, nothing is impossible with God. If you have committed yourself, sold yourself to Him and said, God, I am yours. I'm not no longer my own, but I'm yours. Then nothing is impossible with God. God can make a way. I mean, Joseph's heart must have been broken, to say the least. The woman he loves, the woman he's betrothed to, they're not living together in that year of no sex period. And she's pregnant. And she tells him, it's of God. (laughs) It's a God thing, honey. (laughs) Excuse me if I'm having a battle with this right now. (laughs) Honey, I'm telling you, this angel came into my room in the night hours. Uh Uh-huh. He was an angel. He was an angel. And he told me that I'd be pregnant. So you were alone with this guy. No, 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 listen to me. He came in at night. Yes, and you were alone because I'm in the other room because I made this vow. No, but listen to me. And he told me I'd have a child and it would be a boy and it'll be the deliverer for this nation of Israel. Let me get it right, sweetheart. We don't live in Jerusalem. We're in Nazareth. And you know what they say about Nazareth, right? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? means there's a little bit of, you know what I mean? Promiscuous, sort of, all sorts of things. So this man came to your room. No, it was an angel, but, and he told you to be pregnant. That's right. Uh-huh. But no, he, he, no, it's a miracle, really. Yeah. Have you been taking your medication? No, 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 no. You know, you're a teenager. Yeah, but you need to listen to me. Oh, he didn't think like that, really. Why did he want to divorce her? Why did he want to divorce her? In Matthew 1, verse 20, but after he had considered these things of all the wrong that she has done and divorce her, an angel of the Lord suddenly, say suddenly, <laughs> suddenly appeared to him in a dream. So it wasn't in real life, but in the dream. Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit and she'll give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the word through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant, give birth to a son and they'll name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him and he married her. So when he arrives at his parents' place, or his family place in Bethlehem, they're married, but she's ready to give. <laughs> Amen, whatever you got there, okay. Maybe Siri heard me preaching, was answering, I don't know. Verse 25, but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son. He never had intimacy with her until she gave birth. See, I know we know the story But you need to understand this is an incredible story. It's an incredible story. See, that's why whatever rhema you have, which is revelation, it's got to line up with the Word of God. People come to me all the time telling me they have a feeling or a dream or a thought or whatever else, and I say, is there a Scripture? Because if you haven't got Scripture, it's your say. And as meaningful as that dream is, look, come on, guys. The Bible says even if an angel comes to you and says a different doctrine, reject it. 
It has to line up with Scripture. Joseph Smith claims that his Mormonism is all because of what? An angel who came to him. Isn't that right? The fact of the matter is it must line up with the Word. It doesn't destroy the Word. The angel that came to Joseph Smith and the Mormons says, well, that Bible you have is not enough. It disputes the authenticity of the Word. But what has been told to Joseph is verified in the Scriptures in the book of Isaiah. Now, just because you can find Scripture and just because you have a revelation, just because your husband's on side doesn't mean everybody else is going to feel the same way. And that's why I believe the story has more power when we understand that when they went to the hometown, it wasn't a paid in. But you look at that word in Greek, it also means a family or room in the house. It means a room. It doesn't mean paid, but a room, literally in the Greek. This is what I call outrageous faith in God and outrageous love for Mary. Could you imagine if every marriage was based on, one, outrageous faith in God, and two, then having outrageous love for your spouse? Think about it. Could you imagine if every marriage was based on outrageous faith in God and then outrageous love for your partner. Hmm? Melissa had a birthday this week too, didn't you, Melissa? Monday, wasn't it? Oh, shh, it's too late. And I know your husband has both those qualities. Outrageous faith in God and outrageous love for you. Do you know how I know? Because I get many opportunities to hang out with him one-on-one and privately. And man, does he brag about his God? And does he brag about his wife? That's a good thing. If you have outrageous faith in God and outrageous love for your spouse, you'll overcome every challenge your marriage faces. And the reason why marriages break up is not because they are Christian, it's because they don't have outrageous faith in God and outrageous love for their spouse. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everybody went to be registered, each to his own hometown. And Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. Going back to the story of Mary, if it was bad enough that she, she was not going to know a man but be pregnant and she'd have to get her husband to believe it, it's worse when you have to go to your husband's hometown in that condition. It's like, God, can you cut me a break? It, you know, can you cut me a break? I mean, it's enough that I'm here with Joseph and I've done this, but now I have to go to the hometown when I'm about to give birth. I mean, like, how many months is it when you're not supposed to fly in an airplane? Does anybody remember? What, what's, what's the time? The last two months, is that right? So basically, month seven is it, is that right? You're not supposed to fly, is, is that right? Mandy knows because she's a midwife, best midwife, okay? But she's about to give birth. Now, my understanding and, and how I've looked at it is that the distance, okay, from Nazareth to Bethlehem in imperial system is something like 70 to 170 to 90 miles. In metric, that would mean something like 110 to 144 kilometers. So that's not too bad. He walks, she's on the back of a mule over rugged terrain. 
And she's big, like big. My back. They have to sleep outside in the elements. It's not just beasts, weather, but criminals. See, there are times when you understand the call of God and you have to go on a path on your own. And there are elements that want to disrupt your call. There are elements that you have no control over. I shared the other week, when you find external elements are overbearing and the elements that you cannot have control over, just take control of your reaction. You may not be in a position where you can control what's being said of you, what's being done to you, but you have a control of how you react to it. And with Joseph and Mary, they're not in control about being ordered to make it to Bethlehem. There's no mercy here. Oh, she's pregnant. Let's show her some grace. There's no mercy. They're not in control of how the weather will turn out. They're not in control about what wild beast there might be. And they're not in control of any criminal elements. But what they're in control of, their reaction. And their reaction is, We've heard from God, God's in control. That's what they can be in control of. And you've got to learn in your journey that there will be certain external elements that look to affect you, derail you, misguide you, and hurt you. And you don't have control over them, but you have control over how you react. And if you're not anchored firmly and securely in your place, if you don't learn to develop outrageous faith, then you will get shipwrecked. You will get shipwrecked. Not only is there an outrageous commitment to God and not only is there an outrageous commitment to the partner, but there is an outrageous commitment to each other. They're both in the same area. It's not one to, to it's not just Joseph to Mary or Mary. They are together. Luke 2, 6 to 7, as I've already shared. And while they were there, Bethlehem, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him and uh, wrapped him snugly in cloth and laid him in a feeding trough because there's no room for them at the lodging place. Now HCSB doesn't use the word in because it realizes it's not a good translation. But it uses the word lodging place or room. I'm not saying it's the perfect interpretation, but I don't know what translation you have. But literally means room. Could you imagine it's bad enough an angel says you're going to get pregnant. It's bad enough that there will be no man that is supernatural. It's bad enough that you're Betrothed wants to divorce you or break up, and it's bad enough that there's a sense that you have to return, and it's bad enough that the journey of something like 70 to 144 kilometers is hideous, difficult, and hard. If all that is bad enough, then when you get to the town and you're about ready to give birth, they say, we don't want you in the house. Mandy, there's no midwife in the barn. It's a mere man. (laughs) Now, I was with my wife when she gave birth to Zion. Josiah. That'd be a miracle. I tell you, I have a real problem with the two of them because (laughs) there are moments I have deja vu. You know what I mean? Like, haven't I been there before? And there are moments when I'm with this little guy and I kind of, I kind of go like, yeah, well, I get it mixed up. And there have been times when I've said to Zion, just Zion, he looks at me like, are you all right, Pops? And I go, no, not really. Okay, so, all right. I was in Houston, Texas, okay? Actually, it was in Humble, Texas, but now it's a part of Houston. I was in Houston, Texas with Sandra, Northeast Memorial, I think it's called, hospital, where Sandra gave birth to Josiah. 
We went to, they had Lamar's class, you know, he, he, ho, ho, he, he, ho, ho. I don't know what they do today, probably nothing, but in those days it was about breathing. I had to go to his classes for, I don't know how many weeks. He, 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 ho, ho, he, he. All this breathing. But you know, when they're in there, there's nobody's like, you did this to me. You know what I mean? It's all changes when you're in the actual birthing room, you know. Let go of my shit. <sighs> Mary couldn't do that. Praise God. That's humor. You didn't get it. Okay. But the fact of the matter is, when I could, and it was like she broke water like at 11 a.m., but he wasn't born to 625 something the next day. You know what I mean? Because she broke water or whatever else, we had to stay in the hospital for fear of infection. And uh, when the labor pain started coming, you know what I mean? I just wanted that little fellow to pop out. But he was not accommodating. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it was so many hours, I remember. You know what I mean? I could just see he had a full head of hair. A little, little bit of a crown of the head. I was watching a little bit of a crown of the head coming and coming. And I just said, cut her. Just cut her and get it out. Cut it. You know what I mean? Better to cut than tear. Okay? They did. He did. And it was all good. You know what I'm trying to say? Well, we'll leave it there for now, okay? There's so much more I could share, but we'll leave it there, all right? We'll move along there. But it was a great experience. So to be told there's no room and you're at the mercy of wildlife, well, not wildlife, of livestock and your husband. Could it get any more crude, Lord? Seriously. I mean, it's not like this barn, shed, cave, stable is really state of the ark. See, there's outrageous teamwork in their marriage. If you want to get through, you need outrageous teamwork in your marriage. My wife and I work so hard for teamwork, outrageous teamwork. This is the key. Now, you'd think that maybe it's all over. And then I read Matthew 2, 13 to 15. And after they were gone, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, get up, take the child. We don't know exactly how old he is, between one to two, be less than two because they set the capping age at two. So it's in that one area. Get up, take the child. Uh, and his mother, praise God, this is his mother, and flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is about the search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and escaped to Egypt, and he stayed there until Herod's death, so that, was, so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. I mean, like, how much does this woman have to go through? How much? And they're on the track again to Egypt. See, that's why so many Christians fade out after eight, ten years of the Christian journey. In the 20 to 30, they just become a part of the furniture. They've lost the edge, the hunger, the desire. I bumped into somebody yesterday. I haven't seen them for a couple years. And they came over to see me, very polite, very nice person, like the person. And the person put down his groceries, shook my hand, had a little glint in his eye, says, boy, I've missed you. I said, well, that was your choice. I'm still at the same place every Sunday. Missing me is your own stupidity. We will do things in life which is just stupid. We will do things in life which is this stupid. And we will regret it. We will regret it. This journey for Mary and Joseph and now Jesus is a never-ending journey. The baby Jesus 
was in acute and immediate danger. See, if you understand Bible history, the devil has always wanted to kill babies. When Abraham was called out of his father's land, it was a land filled with child sacrifice. That's why when God said to him, give me your son, he doesn't understand as being worshipped, but he understands the culture he's from, which means if he says, give me your son, it means sacrifice him. I mean, it was during the day of Moses that his mother put him in that little basket into the Red Sea. I mean, you've got alleg crocodiles, you've got hippos. I mean, who knows what could have happened? Because there was this law that male children two and under would be butchered and killed. Gehana, which is in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and when the Bible talks about uh, hell in the Gospel, it's talking about Gehana, and Gehana is a literal place. It's still there today in Jerusalem. It's now filled with apartments and housing. But Gehana in the days of Jesus was a place of a dump. It was a dump where it would burn 24 hours a day. It would stink. It would be where the bodies of carcasses of animals that died were thrown onto this never-ending burning fire, and the carcasses and that of criminals killed or butchered would be thrown on the area. And when Jesus says, better for you to be uh, uh, in hell or Gehana or, or anyone who's one of these children harm will go to hell, it's talking about Gehana in a place of stench, stench and fire and torment. It's talking about a physical place. But this place in the days of the kings was where they sacrificed children. Today in Jerusalem, it's a modern-day development of housing. In the day of Jesus, it, was a, it seemed like an eternal pit burning of rubbish. It was a rubbish tip. But in the days of the kings is where they human sacrifices of babies. Manasseh, everybody. And there's been this plan from the world dot to kill babies. And when you understand biblical areas, you understand that what we see today just totally links into it. Joseph has outrageous faith in God, remember? So he takes his wife and son and they flee. Can you musicians come up? No, actually, just a keyboardist because we're going to do something special tomorrow. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 19 to 23, and after Herod died, a number of years, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in the dream to Joseph. Again, this is the third time. He says, get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel because those who sought the child's life are dead. Herod is dead. So he got up and took the child and his mother and entered the land of Israel. But when he heard that Achilles was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the region of Galilee. Then he went and settled in a town called Nazareth to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. I love these passages of scriptures. One thing I've learned in the journey of Joseph and Mary is that God is constantly speaking to them. The next time we read about Jesus, he's like 12 years of age where he sits before learned people and he's not in the group traveling back for three days and three nights. You see, the Christian walk is not where God speaks to you once. It's not like where one guy said, you know, my wife's giving me a hard time. I've been married 12 years. And, and she said to me, honey, you don't tell me you love me. And he turned to her and said, honey, the day I married you, I said, I love you. And I haven't changed my mind. So I haven't said it again. I mean, if that's how you have a marriage, no wonder you've got problems. In the Christian walk, God constantly needs to speak to you because the situations change. 
You might say, I don't need to get closer to God because 20 years ago I made a decision for the Lord and I have not changed my mind. That's how Christians think. Excuse me if I'm a bit vulgar here, would you mind? You're a buffed. The joy of the Lord is my salvation. It's a renewal. It's a continuous watering and drinking. It's continuous. In at least a period of a decade, at least, we see where God is constantly speaking to Joseph how to guide his family, how to save them, how to keep them together. If there are a couple of lessons I want to take in finishing from this, it's this. Number one, have an outrageous commitment to your partner, no matter what. Obeying God means maintaining the sacred covenant of marriage. Do your absolute best to weather serious attacks on your marriage from within and without. Number one, have an outrageous commitment to your spouse, no matter what. Number two, have an outrageous love for your spouse. Not just a commitment, but a love. There ought to be nothing undone on your list of things that you want to do for your spouse. If your spouse has a need, your job is to do whatever you you can to meet it, even if it comes at personal cost. Joseph puts himself and his reputation at huge risk because of his love for Mary. He doesn't care about himself. He cares about Mary and what is best for her. That's true love. Number three, we need outrageous teamwork as a couple. I see this in Joseph and Mary. It's difficult and painful, but we need to work as a team towards a love for each other and for God. And it can be difficult and painful at times to keep that love burning for your spouse. Not that I've ever had that problem for my wife. Nor you with me, honey. Oh, good. Okay. And the key is not because she has the perfect husband. Long way short. But the key is we have an outrageous love for God first. And that's what enables us to love. Because when you love someone, you love what they love. Joseph and Mary have a third member on their team. It's God. And teamwork does not grow significant when it's smooth riding. It grows significant through rough waters. And as a result of dealing with traumatic circumstances, Joseph and Mary become a terrific and close team, a team of three. Number four, I learned from Joseph and Mary, is have an outrageous faith in God as individuals and as a couple. My wife and I, I'd like to think, have outrageous faith in God individually, but we also have outrageous, explosive faith when we come together. God will always be faithful and show you what to do. Your job is to follow the path He reveals, not your interpretation. It's all about God and what He wants them to do. Now, God will probably not speak to you personally through an angel. I understand that. But He will show you what to do through the Word of God, through prayer, through ministry. It's a process. And the rewards, a closer and stronger marriage, a closer personal relationship with God, a closer relationship with God as a couple. Best of all, you get to experience the reward of living God's adventure for you as a couple. You know, Sandra and I like to talk about our adventures. The adventures about how God brought us together. The adventures of how we did life together in the ministry in Australia for eight years, then in the United States for three years, then back here for 26, 27 years. It's an adventure. And we talk about the adventure to come. Although we only know it in part, we speak about it. We pray about it. We talk. I don't know what calamity you've had. It could be the calamity of a disease or sickness. It could be a calamity like too many have in this church this last year of losing a loved one. It could be a calamity um, of broken relationships. 
where the other party doesn't seem to want to reconcile. I don't, I don't know. But this is what I want you to know. God hasn't forsaken you or forgotten you in that journey. He's there with you. And if you will allow him, he'll speak to you. He'll speak to you. Not that you won't have to go through things, but he'll protect you through those things. The final message in the series, Most Outrageous Couples. What do I think? Well, I think this is the best message. It's the best message. Because it's about the victory, the breakthrough. When I get to heaven, well, that's only a temporary place because it's back here. But when I get to be with the Lord, I doubt I'll need to ask the question, he'll just come. I'd like to know what happened to Joseph. Did he die? What happened? But I know this. You may not be the biological father of the child, but you can give great protection and favor for that child. We have children, youth in this church who are abandoned by their father, in a sense, that need big brother or big sister beside them, helping out the mothers. I had one wonderful young woman contact me and say, Pastor, you know, my son is young, primary school, being bullied. How do I handle it? Because I have the husband to talk to. They need that big brother situation to get beside them and help them work together. We have those cases in the church. Hmm? We need people to realize that you may not be the biological parent, but you can still play a tremendous role in loving and helping and assisting. You may not have any children. That's still not an excuse because you could be a spiritual parent. It takes a tribe to raise a child. Father, I just pray right now that as we have finished this series, there's been some very interesting ones, to say the least. That I finish this one leading up to Christmas. And I say thank you for an outrageous couple. An outrageous couple, first of all, that loved you, that enabled them to love each other, and that enabled them to love your core. We need adventures in our life. We need God with us in those adventures. If you feel like you're in an adventure right now, even though it's not the adventure you want, would you stand to your feet right now? You're in a type of adventure. I want you to stand up right now. It might not be the exact adventure you want, but you're in an adventure. Would you stand up? So I've got a little secret for you. If you're born again, and you've given your life to Jesus, and you said to the Lord, I'm yours, whether you want to acknowledge or not, you are in an adventure. <laughs> you say, oh, no, it's too rough to be God. Really? Did you not hear my message? Life is so boring. Well, I can present to you several things you could be doing in the life of the church to make it not so boring. Father, I stand with friends I stand with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, co-laborers in the field of God. And I ask you to bless them. In this adventure, I know the key, Lord, if they're married, will be their outrageous love for you, their outrageous love for their partner, their outrageous love for each other, and the idea and understanding that you are with them in every step. If they're on their own, then realize they're not on their own, for God is with you. For if God be for you, then who can be against you? That in all these things we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. I speak His peace, favor, grace, blessing over you upon our marriages. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Those of you who are not married and you want to be married, could you stand to your feet? That could mean you're single. It could mean you were once married, but you are not married and you want to be married. Would you stand to your feet? 
That's a relief, Mom. You're sitting down. Praise God. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a relief. Praise God. Not that I would stop it. But... Father, I pray over those who are standing. I understand they're lonely. They want a companion. And even when I spoke about this message, they said in their heart, if only I had such a person. Well, you know, I don't always understand the ways of God. There are some who have an illness or a handicap that we're waiting for God to heal. In the meantime, they've learned to be content. And so it is with you. It's not that God has called you to be single, but rather God would say to you in this time, be content with Him. Don't make a rash or hideous decision. I cover you in the peace and the purity of the Lord. In Jesus' name.